All right, all right. Hey, you can turn to the book of Galatians. We'll get there in a bit. I want to set this up. Uh, So exciting to be here uh, with you today. I've been gone for a few weeks. I'm grateful for our leaders and our staff, a team that I was able to get away for kind of a study break, a little getaway. Um, I was in Colorado, actually. Anybody been to Colorado lately? Anybody? Okay. Um, That's where I wish I was, actually, right now. But with you all, I wish you were all there with me. Uh, It got down to, sorry, not sorry, it got down into the 40s at night. And so you had to have your sweatshirt and all that good stuff. But we had a great time. I was at a uh, Christian guest ranch. It was a horse ranch. And uh, speaking with dear friends, and uh, you need to join us some, some summer. It's Wind River Ranch. But had a great time and enjoyed being away, but I'm um, so excited to be back. Genuinely, like for real, excited to be back. As Rodney noted, um, I think we broke a streak yesterday, only 99 yesterday. So we broke the 100 streak, but uh, fall is coming. And as he noted, everybody picked this up. This is, uh, this is exciting. Uh, I am so excited about all of us coming back. You're going to hear me today really challenging all of us. Great crowd today. Uh, Some of you are watching online, and I'm just going to say it's time. It's time to come back. Now, not everybody's back. School hadn't started yet, but it is time. You know, the great pandemic uh, really impacted the world. We've talked about it a lot. Uh, But what we're seeing now, the great pandemic, the great resignation you've heard about a lot of people leaving their jobs moving here and there i've even read in my circles of pastors and church you know ministry uh, the great volunteer resignation where people once serving in the church have gotten out of pattern over time and now no longer do so and so i'd ask you are you serving in the church what's your ministry that's the question we always ask what's your ministry what are, you, what are you doing? And if some of you uh, are saying, well, I've never served in children's ministry or I've never served in that area or I've never really found my spot. We want to help you do that. Even tonight, we have a next-gen gathering of leaders from preschoolers all the way up to high school. We're going to be up in the loft. Just show up. Uh, take advantage of these opportunities and get to know how you can get plugged in. We had 23 uh, new folks at Discovery last week continue to people join in the church uh, right here in the summertime. And if you're not a member of our church and you've been coming, I talked to a couple this morning, join uh, today. We have an uh, opportunity for you at the end of our service. We'd love to talk to you. So many exciting things are happening. Uh, as Rodney noted, yesterday was amazing over at uh, Vickery with our friends there, people from around the world, literally, that were able to serve and talk, uh, talk, to Je- talk about Jesus with them at all the nations. Um, you may not know, but you can rejoice. We have an adult, uh, young adult ministry that is meeting over at the Angelica at, at uh, Mockingbird Station. They had over 200 adults this past Tuesday night, and it continues to grow. We're having to move to another theater, right? To, uh, yeah, praise the Lord. We're having to move we keep moving because we're running out of space and we're just saying, Lord, continue. And many of these young adults don't go to church anywhere. Like many of them don't, don't know the Lord and they're hearing the message of grace every Tuesday night. A lot of great things are happening, but still this great pandemic that we're still, you know, in some ways coming out of has created a great upheaval. And we're all sensing it. It's the new normal that they warned us about. I talked about a lot. And uh, maybe your life is still, things are still spinning. And it's hard to land, isn't it? I'm going to challenge us today. That the way that we find freedom from all of that anxiety and stress and the new way of measuring things and what does my life look like now, that we find freedom from all of that by turning to the Lord as we understand His promise that He's made to us. I love that anthem that our, that our choir just sang. He he is our peace. You know, likely more than anything you need today is peace. Peace from it all. And we find it in him. So today we're going to talk about how in Christ we, we, we receive the promise that he's given to us. And we discover our purpose. And, it, and we then submit, we, we, we give ourselves to the people of God. So here's what we've said throughout this series. I started way back at the beginning of July with this statement. Freedom is not doing whatever you want to do. Freedom is doing what you ought to do. Now that first line, that first sentence is exactly where people in America are today. 
In fact, I was looking at a study that was done by the American Worldview Inventory. Didn't know that was a thing. But the worldview that many people have, representing 2,000 adults, it showed that participants in that survey, 54% said there is no moral absolute. There's no absolute truth in the world. Now, what are you left with there? Another study, Gallup poll, for the first time ever, this past, uh, just recently, this year, came out with, having done this for decades, more than 50% of all Americans say there is no moral authority outside of myself. There's no standard for what is right or wrong. Another study I saw showed 58% of Americans, we're not talking about post-Christian, you know, Europe or somewhere else. We're talking about America. A post-truth culture is a post-Christian culture by definition. And we, you know, I've been at this long enough. I remember 30 years ago, we're talking about this. Like, you know, people aren't believing the absolute truth anymore. Now we're seeing this played out. So play this out with me. Where does that go? Where does that lead us? In in one of the many books I've read this summer, Carl Truman wrote a book called The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. In it, he points to Jean-Paul Sartre, the great French philosopher, who said, if there is no, he's not a Christian, he said, if there's no absolute truth outside of ourselves, there's no moral authority outside of each of us individually. And really, if there's no God, is what that would be. There's got to be an ultimate truth, right? A giver of all truth of right and wrong. He said this, he said, then man is destined or he he said, damned, actually condemned to be free. Meaning it's left to you now to find out what your purpose is. You determine your identity. You decide what the meaning of life is. You're the one who has to make sense of this world. You are the one who has to, here's the word, justify your existence. And then he says, that is a life that is filled, it's a recipe for a life that's filled with anxiety. It's hard to be God. That's what he's saying. Now, those are my words, but that's what he's saying. Here's this secular philosopher. And he goes where every other great thinker, philosopher has ever gone. If you remove God from the equation, ultimately it's a nihilistic existence. There's no meaning in life. And, and, And so if there's no truth outside of ourselves, if there's no authority, moral authority outside of ourselves, then it's anybody's game, right? And here's the ironic twist. Seeking to be free, we're in bondage. If you can't do what you ought to do, that's not freedom, right? Are you tracking with me? That's bondage. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches. And if we would just turn, right, to the truth of God, we wouldn't be having these crazy thoughts that I'm the center of my universe, I'm the one who can determine what's right or wrong, and I even read this this week. No longer are we talking about right, uh, or how about this, good and evil. Now the conversation is around what's good and what's bad. Just the pragmatic approach. Evil implies something spiritual, something else going on. So in a secular world, we're now changing language around all things. Marriage is now something else. To be man or woman is now something. We're redefining all things because we've moved away from God's word. Someone said if God wanted us to live in a world of moral uncertainty, he would have given us 10 suggestions rather than 10 commandments. So how does all this come into play with our relationship with God? I want you to turn to Galatians 3. Long time to get set up here. Paul is speaking in context here to a people who, more than us, who lived, their whole lives are built around the commandments. What I'm going to call, what Paul references as the law. You can put a capital L, the law. Okay? So uh, the law is not just the Ten Commandments, but 613 other Levitical dietary laws that you see in, in the Old Testament. Their whole lives are built around this. Like you had to follow the law. You had to do all of these things. And then Jesus shows up and he says, okay, I've come to fulfill the law. 
not to abolish it. And, and if, you're, if you're thinking with me, now wait, did Jesus, but did he follow all the dietary law? Did he follow every Levitical law? Did he do every, did he do all? Because I think he got in trouble for not doing that. What Jesus did was he got underneath the law to the heart of the law, the heart of God, and he lived it out perfectly. You see, even you and I, if anyone were to keep all the commands, and Paul would say, I, you know, I'm a Pharisee, I did it, I've done this. But everything that we do is skewed by an improper motivation from our sinful hearts. So Isaiah 64, 6 says that, that even our best righteous acts are filthy rags before a holy God. So none of us can keep the law. Jesus comes and says, I will keep it for you. Last week in the early part of, of Galatians 3, if you were here and heard uh, Grant Glover preach, Megan Hendrickson was over in the Great Hall, but they, they referenced what Paul says, this word accredited. It's an accounting term. If you were here, you heard this. Um, you know, shout out to all of our accountants. He uh, says, what's happened is now your, your account has been fully paid. His, all of his righteousness is accredited to your deficit of such, zero in your account. He fills it up. He, he completely pays off the debt, if you will, and you don't have to pay it back at all. And so he's saying it's by faith, not by works. This has been on repeat throughout Galatians. If you've been with us at all, you're like, I think I've heard this before. I think I've heard this before. And Paul's gonna say, I'm gonna say it again. I'm gonna say it again. And we're gonna do the same. We're going to come at grace and the gospel from every angle possible because you can't go deeper than the gospel. You can't dive deeper than the gospel. This is my challenge to all of our teachers. I see some of you out here, connect group leaders. Let's always land with grace. Wherever you go, always come back to Jesus. And Paul's going to ask the question, why the law? Now, I'm guessing you didn't wake up this morning and uh, getting ready for church today. And you're thinking, why did God give the law? to his people 3,500 years ago. I hope Jeff talks about this today. I, that's right on the front you know, of my mind today. I'm doubting that's the case, but this is not simply a, a kind of a cold historical account or intellectual exercise. This is a really good news, but I'm gonna tell you it is a, an intellectual exercise, a lot to cover here in this short period of time. Paul has been saying on repeat, here's kind of the banner over this whole series. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. That's the statement that I want in your mind and in your heart. And he's been saying from the very start, remember in chapter one, if you've been with us, or or, or have read this before, he's speaking to Judaizer, says, no, you gotta add a little something. Gotta add to, like we're good with Jesus, but you have to add to, right? And, And this is what has happened still happens today. I mean, when you look at Mormonism, when you look at uh, Islam, does the same. Any pseudo-Christian group will say, like Jesus, he's awesome, but we're gonna add to what he's done. And Paul says in Galatians 1, if even an angel comes in upstate New York and reveals to you a different gospel, it's heresy. You add anything to the gospel, the moment you do, then it is no longer the gospel. And so he is livid about this and he is not happy that they've turned away. So now he's saying, listen, let's let's talk about the law because all of you Jewish people, you folks who are bent towards legalism and trying to live this life out, you need to understand the law actually reveals the purpose. It's the promise of God, the purpose of God, and it points us to then the people of God. First, the promise of God. Look at verse 15 to give a human example. Okay, so now he's been talking about how the promise, again, has come, the promise to Abraham has actually come through Jesus. He says, let me, let me parse this out further. To give a human example, brothers and sisters, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it has been ratified. That is, nobody nullifies an original agreement um, after it's been finalized. He's saying, even you know this. So he gives, you know, human example. He he says, any promise or covenant you make, you you guys know this. Like, you know, and I I could argue the highest, I guess, level of covenant agreement is is in marriage. Uh, A high covenant agreement in in, in the church as well, in the body of Christ. But we have a high commitment. If I were to say to Stacy, uh, a couple years into our marriage, hey, I know that we committed to loving each other like Jesus. But, you know, here's what I want. If you would do these things, when you sign a contract, you do these certain things 
then this marriage will continue on and really flourish. You know, she'd be like, no, 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 no. We already made a promise and you're not going to nullify the promise or add to it. Paul's trying to say, okay, the law comes along. The question we ask is, well, well wait a minute. What, what, what does that change the promise along the way? It's like a will once written is law can't be changed. Look at verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. He says, note the singular. He's, he's arguing, it's always been the case. Not descendants, though, yes, that's coming. But the descendant, Jesus, is Abraham's offspring. The one and only, through whom the promise of God then is distributed to everybody else. This is the argument that he's making. Notice he calls him Christ. I think you know this. This is not Jesus' last name. <laughs> this is a title, Messiah, Christos. He is the Messiah. Again, speaking to Jews, he, he's the one. He's the fulfillment of the promise. Look at verse 17. This is what I mean. They keep playing this out. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul, right, nullify a covenant previously ratified, finalized by God so as to make the promise void. He's saying, let's go back to the original contract. There's no fine print. It is what it is and it still is. There's nothing we're adding to it here. Look at verse 18. For if the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise. But God gave it to Abraham by a promise. All right, now, hang with me. I told you there's a lot today. I think you can handle it. Genesis 12 is when, when God says to Abraham, You're gonna be, I'm going to bless you. And, and, and I'm going to bless you. You're going to be the father of many nations. And through you, you're going to bless the whole wide world. And then it says in Genesis 15 that, that, that then he's 90 years old. He's got no kids. Abraham says, um, I'm running out of time. And God, what's happening? I thought you promised this to me. And God says, I did promise to you. And I will keep my promise and I will provide. And then it says, here, here's the key moment. Then it says that Abraham was reckoned as righteous, accredited with righteousness, made right, justified before God because of his faith. Because it says Abraham believed. And then he was, he was reckoned as righteous. He believed that God would come through for him. He trusted in God. If you want to know how were people made righteous? How were they saved before Christ? They believed in God and they trusted in him. This is what Abraham has done. Paul's making the argument here that Abraham was accounted righteous, justified by his faith, not his works all along. So in Romans 4, and you may know that Romans unpacks this. You want to dive deep, Romans 6, 7, gosh, 8, you continue on. But Romans 4, he says this, he's, he explains, he's, he's offering commentary. No unbelief made him, Abraham, waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew stronger in his faith as he gave glory to God. As you have faith in God, you grow in faith. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. He was made right, not through the law, but through faith. Now, Paul's brilliance on display again, he preemptively asked the question everybody wants to ask. All, all the Jews are like, well, then why the law? Why in the world? If it's always been prom uh, the promise and it's always been faith, then why the law we've given our lives to this? This is radical shift. I mean, this is a major shift. No one's ever taught this kind of thing. No one has heard the words of Jesus like this, telling us there's another way. It was added because of transgressions. Okay, another way to say this, to, to keep sinful people on track with the promise until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Okay, now, now you think, now we're getting weird. What is he talking about? What is going on? The law was a thoughtful, preordained, addition to, uh, to the original covenant, but it's always been the way, the way of salvation until Christ, the descendant would come inheriting the promises, distributing them all to the rest of us. But what's this bit about angels and intermediary? He's saying the law was not a firsthand encounter with God. 
This is interesting. He's saying that the promise was to the individual, individuals. The promise is to you and to me, anyone who has faith. That's anyone who would believe in God and ultimately in Christ. He's saying the original uh, uh, covenant, if you will, promise was given. It was arranged by angelic messengers through a middleman. And that was whom? The law given Thank you. Moses, yes, you got it. But if there's a middleman, then, then at Sinai, then the people are not dealing directly with God, are they? Moses, and then he distributes it to, to, he's saying this, the original promise is a direct blessing from God received by faith. You see how he's arguing this? Now look at verse 20. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. Okay, what, is, what does that mean? Paul is saying the promise is from God to us. This is not a contract. This is what he's saying. A contract demands two people who do their part. We've not done our part. We have never done our part. We will never do our part. This is a one-way promise from God. It's why I often say that grace is one-way love. The only thing we bring to the contract, if you will, I say it often, is our sin that makes it necessary. This is God coming to us. It's a promise from God to us. So wait, don't we have to do something? Believe. Faith, not works. Now, if you're tracking with me here, you could say, but what, was it Jesus? Jesus, I've heard referred to as an intermediary. Wasn't he the intermediary? Yes. And he's God. God, the Father sends God the Son, dies on the cross for us, one way love, fills us with his Holy Spirit, and we're able to live the life he's called us to live. So look at this, verse 20. It says, for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. This is, oh, I'm sorry, this is Romans 3.20. Since through the law, comes knowledge of sin okay so what why the law this is one of his one of his reasons uh it's like me driving to colorado okay if you've ever done this you've gone up how many of you have gone up like what is it 287 287 87 you've done this so you have little towns along the way anybody know them like there's claude there's what clarendon there's Kwana, something else. There's all these little towns. So you drive up, you're going up there, you're going 75 miles an hour, just trying to, it's a long trip. And, and then you, bam, you hit 55 miles an hour. Oh, there's a sign. Whoo, better slow down. Oh, 35. Whoo, better slow down. Because you're just cruising along, you hit these little towns. But here's what's, here's what's interesting. In the moment that I see I'm driving 75, oh, 55. I'm technically, I'm breaking the law. Like, oops, this is 55. The point is, I'm already speeding. The sign just showed me that I am. I was speeding. It's like a recall. I recently had a recall on my, on my car, this Toyota 4Runner. I had a recall. Recall tells me you got a problem. I already had the problem, right? Your car may explode if you're, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, it wasn't that, but it was something, you know. You've got to get this thing fixed. That's what the law does. The law reveals the problem, already have the problem. It simply says, this is your problem. You cannot live up to the holy crushing demands of God's law. So the law points us to the promise and the law also points us to the purpose. We see this in verses 21 through 25. It's a foreshadowing. Look at verse 21. Is the law then contrary? So he goes further and he's asking the question. Everybody's asking. So wait, this seems contrary to the law the promises of God certainly not he says if it's by faith and not the law then does it contradict the law is what he's saying for if a law had been given that could give life then righteousness would indeed be by the law but the scripture you could argue or say the law the all-encompassing law scripture imprisoned everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who work really hard and get after it and keep the law. No, who believe? Again, there it is. I've likened it to a mirror. You know, you got up this morning, looked in the mirror. Most of y'all looked in the mirror. I can tell. You look good. 
everybody's looking good this morning. You look in the mirror, and here's what happens. If you're having a bad hair day, or if you see that you're having a bad hair life, and you, you don't know exactly what to do with it all, you, you see the problem, you don't pull the mirror off the wall to try to fix the problem. The mirror is not designed to fix the problem. The mirror reveals the problem. I can say it this way. The mirror defines reality. You can't get away from it. The law defines reality. You and I are sinners, hell bound apart from a holy God. The law reveals that to us. Look at verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So before Christ comes, where we have trust and faith in what he's done, the law places you and I in, we're in our own Alcatraz. We're in our own prison cell. And what we thought was freedom is bondage. That's the ironic twist in our day. He uses this word pedagogos. Maybe you've heard this, a guardian. It's uh, in Greek culture there at, at the time. There's a Greek tutor who comes along, a child conductor, comes on with the child and, and, and takes them to school, tutors them and protects them, keeps them from danger and distraction, keeps them focused. This is what he's saying. The law has done this. The law has been teaching us all along, but the law doesn't bring life. It only brings death. So the law has a negative role and a positive role. It shows us our sin points us to our need. Christ comes. Now we're all sons and daughters in him received by faith. If you've received his gift of grace and now we no longer need a tutor. He says, don't need that anymore. Christ is now the way he's the teacher. And so we see that the law points us to the promise of God all along. It points us to the purpose of God that we'd be redeemed by Jesus. And then finally I'll land with this, the people of God. It calls us to submit and to join the people of God. This was the plan and promise all along. Abraham would raise up a people who would bless the world. Jesus comes, now the church, the new covenant people of God. And then it says in verse 26, for in Christ Jesus, Messiah, Savior, Rescuer, Je, G, G, J, Joshua, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There's no male or female. For you are all one in Christ. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. You see how he just lands it, summarizes it. Here's what he's saying. Like, like in our day, even in our day, there's, there's a lot of talk around, wait, is there male or female? Can, can men have babies? Can, what, is there, what's he talking about here? No, we're all distinct. Yes, there's all of that. That's his point. It's very diverse. But he's saying faith is the great equalizer. That's what he's saying. He's saying that there is no, there's no um, free and slave. And in this culture, there's no men and women somehow subservient. There's no, there's no Greek. There's no Jew. It's not those who are in and out. Now he's saying there's no, in our day, there's no Jew. There's no Greek. There's no, there's no, can I say it? Rich or poor. There's no Republican or Democrat. There's no American or Russian. There's no China, Chinese or Ukrainian. We're all one in Christ. And you can read Revelation 7, verse 9, among other places, that shows us every tribe, every nation, all people from around the world are coming together in this big family of faith because of faith in Christ and what he's done. This is the promise fulfilled all along. And someday we're going to be together in eternity and we're going to be worshiping resurrected, a resurrected Savior on a resurrected earth. And friends, the great pandemic, the great upheaval, the great sorting out will be accomplished because of the great exchange that has come to us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Praise be to God for this amazing gift that he's given to us. I want you to take your element that you have there. We have just a moment. And I realize this is a short period of time. Elements that you have that are the Lord's Supper. If you don't have them, uh, let us 
Can we serve one another? Can we help each other? Everybody have, have elements that you need? Okay. And we'll get there in, in just a moment. I want to read this. John Stott is the one who said this. Everybody's either held captive by the law because he is still awaiting the fulfillment of the promise or delivered from the law because he has inherited the promise. More simply, everybody is living either in the Old Testament or the New and derives his or her religion either from Moses or from Jesus. And friends, before we we partake, you are either condemned under the law or you have been set free in Christ. Which is it for you? And if you have never received Christ as your Savior, we want, to, we want to talk to you about that. In fact, I'll give you an opportunity to do that. Because if you've never received Christ and you partake, this means nothing to you. Frankly, nothing. Because what we're doing here, if we partake of the elements together, we are saying, I have received this. And just as baptism is an ordinance that says, I have died to myself. And I've been raised up. How about this? First, Christ died. He was raised up. I take on that cruciform life. And now, partaking of the Lord's Supper, we're saying so much that this is me, I'm actually going to eat and drink this. Like, this is my sustenance. It's who I am. It becomes me. If you've never received Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do so right now. So let's, let's pray together. Uh, and friends, all of you praying that we would commit ourselves to God in, in, in ways we never have before. I'm so thankful for so many of you who are more in than you've ever been. And Lord, we give our lives to you. And I pray, friend, if you're here today and you've never received Christ, you're watching me online. If you have never settled this by faith, that can begat more faith. You come to him and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I give up. You are my authority. You are Lord, that's the word, of my life. I give you my life. Thank you for the grace extended to me because of your death on the cross and your resurrection. I give you my life. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen.